वॉचिंग चैनल वाई चैनल वाई अ साउथ एशियन कनेडियन चैनल चैनल वाई एन आई एम विनय शर्मा Perhaps the biggest disruption in the mankind some 200 years back was the invention of steam engine. It changed the course the way businesses were done, economies were run, and on this day today we talk about flying cars, uh, we talk about drones leaving the pizza at high skyscrapers, and automatic self-driven driverless cars actually that can actually bring many more disruptions. So we have an expert authority from the Simon Fraser University here and she is Shobhna Jaya Madhavan, Associate Vice President of SFU. Real pleasure to have you here ma'am. Pleasure. Vinay. So perhaps we live in the most disrupting times. I mean we see so much of uh, uh, say startup nurturing, new build up of ecosystem happening around us and these are these 10 or coming five ten years, they're actually going to be very different. You know, when we look at from a dis disruptive viewpoint, right? Throw some light. What is happening? And then later on, we would like also like to talk to you about SFU's collaboration with India. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me here, Vinay, and uh, really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I think you're absolutely right when we compare what's going on today in 2020 to what our grandparents or even parents experienced the disruption is unbelievable. And there isn't a single sector or aspect of our life that's not being disrupted, yeah. right? Whether it's health, real estate, education, uh, the way we pay for things, everything is being uh, disrupted. You know, the digital economy is transforming uh, countries all around the world. Um, so I think the biggest, uh, uh, I think, challenge for this uh, generation of ours is how do you keep up with this extraordinary fast-paced change. How do educational institutions keep up with educating the masses? Uh, how do countries take care of skilling people uh, when the change is so fast? And how do businesses find people um, who understand this disruption and who can add value uh, you know, to the business? Then there's another side, which, you know, I'm a social worker by trade. Yeah. Uh, so another side that fascinates me is the social impact of all this change. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, those of us who are following uh, the disruptive uh, technologies or uh, change in societies around the world, uh, I think uh, it's prudent for us to pay attention to the economic impacts, the pros and cons, but also the social impacts and how do we balance it out so that society and humankind you know, can thrive and survive all of this change. Yeah, very right. And with these innovations, with these uh, new disruptions, I mean, some are actually pointing to the fact that there could be some job losses also, there could be new challenges because the existing professions, they may cease to exist 10 years or five years down the line. So in a way, what I'm trying to say that what we teach at universities or academic institutions at the moment, I mean, those subjects, they may just fade out in coming five, 10 years. So do you see that as a challenge? Because in a way, when we say that robots are performing surgeries in um, hospitals, healthcare institutes, so we are actually saying that electrical engineer is replacing a doctor, right? What do you have to say on that? Yeah, I think the future of work has been a topic of great interest and concern yeah for different groups around the world, not just governments and policymakers and academics, but people in general. Yeah. And I think like change is something that excites a group of people, yeah. but terrifies another group True. of people. True. I think that's just the True. you know the way societies and people react, yeah. operate. But I think if you look at what research suggests, and uh, SFU for instance, last year had a community summit where the topic was actually future of work. Oh. And we looked at what does all of this disruption and change mean? Uh, for society at large, but specifically for people who need jobs in the future. Um, and you know, and then there's a lot of you know scare mongering that happens. For example, artificial intelligence, you know, is going to take yeah. over the world, yeah. robots are going to do surgery. Yeah. And while yes, it's true, artificial intelligence is going to do a lot of the analytics, and robots, yes, are going to perform surgery and maybe even be companions yeah. for elders around the world. Uh, the truth of the matter is society has always evolved and changed. Yeah. You know, what my grandparents did or did not do doesn't resonate with what I do or do not do, yeah. right? So the professions that were there 50 years ago probably have evolved, changed, or ceased to exist because technology has come in, our skill sets are different. Um, and I think we're exactly in the same spot now. Yeah. What is, I think, exciting about this is that this is a chance for all of us to take a good look at 
our knowledge, skills and abilities, upskill if needed, adapt to the changes, but also look at how we can introduce right from kindergarten all the way up to postdoc, how we can introduce new courses, new expectations for students, better collaboration with businesses, you know, and with research organizations to make sure we keep up with the changing times. So I personally think these are exciting times because skilled people, they can transfer those skills to different areas. So a lot of businesses, for example, I was reading Deloitte, for instance, yeah. you know, is putting a lot of money and effort into making sure their workforce adapts to the future of work. Right. Universities like SFU, yeah. we have, for example, entrepreneurship uh, courses that are available to students from all faculties and all streams. Right. Uh, the BC government, for example, is uh, encouraging entrepreneurship right at the elementary school level. So I think these are exciting times, and I personally, uh, I'm not seeing it as a negative necessarily, but yes, it will have social consequences. We need to manage cultural, uh, you know, pieces of society, uh, because in a lot of societies, certain professions are revered and yeah. others are not. Sure. We need to understand that dynamic. We also have to make sure women can participate, you know, in a full yeah. and meaningful way. And those cultural expectations around women, you know, are modified and altered with changing times. Right. Uh, and societies that are less risk-taking, for instance, we've got to be able to encourage them to embrace entrepreneurship uh, in a bigger way. So I think for everybody, government, businesses, educational institutions, individuals, I think these are exciting times. All right. And you recently attended Women Economic Forum mm -hmm. also in New Delhi. All right, we'll come on to that. I mean, let's continue with a bit on the, more on the skill development and the disruptions. All right, so how do students, they adapt to this, the new changes? Because they are also like, or like they have to make a decision and they, when they see so many options, because today's youth, they have become, whether they are in Canada or they are in India, they have actually become very innovative and they have actually become very, uh, say, uh, entrepreneurial by nature they want to experiment right on the day one it's not that they just want to go for the job many of them they are actually starting their own business small companies and all so how do they look at these very disruptions and also like uh, many I, even in india i see that happening here also like there is a uh, uh, i mean they are trying to link industry and the academia how does that how is how do you see that happening because some of the corporates the biggest corporates like wipro uh, and all uh, some of them they are really pumping in huge energy in incubation centers and new innovations it's the, for instance Mahindra and Mahindra even uh, Infosys right yes absolutely I mean I think there are many ways in which we can ensure that uh, children and youth and young adults can actually keep up with the changing times and I'm a strong believer um, I personally look at my own life and I think education was the f biggest uh, and the strongest influence in my life. Yeah. Um, and so I think education, and when I say education, there's formal, there's informal education. I think the curriculum uh, that countries uh, adopt in the education system, the way in which it is taught, and the way in which classrooms allow risk-taking uh, and explorations in a very curious free-spirited way are very important for entrepreneurship. And I think countries are doing that. Yeah. Um, when I was in India, um, I was amazed by the number of young people yeah. who were entrepreneurs. Yeah. Also a lot of support for yeah. women to yeah. start businesses. And a very right kind of culture is setting Yes, yeah. um, but there are some barriers and every country has those barriers. Yeah. So for example, if you look at the ease of doing business, yeah. right, you look at the rankings every year. Um, India is somewhere in the you know 60 to 65 range. Canada is in the top 25, right? Um, so what that really means is that if I'm a young person and I want to boldly you know move down the entrepreneurial path, depending on where I live, it will determine how many barriers and obstacles I have to overcome. And what that means is stress, a lot more use of resources, a lot more time basically wasted in trying to navigate that system before you can actually achieve what you want to achieve. So it might be much easier to do some of those things in countries like, like Canada. But having said that, India, for instance, has some tremendous resources. For example, under 25, 
we have more than you know 500 million young people under yeah. the age of 25. Yeah. So in terms of human resources and talent, yeah. like we absolutely are privileged in India. Whereas if we compare it against some countries, you know, Japan, Canada, we have an aging population yeah. and a smaller population. So you might have you know, an education system, you might have curriculum, you might have grants and funding available, but you don't have enough people to grab it and run with it. True. So these are some of the unique challenges depending on, on where you are. But I want to go back to curriculum. So I, I share this quite often when people ask me, you know, look back at your life in India, because I went to school in India. Yeah. Uh, from grade two to my master's, I studied in India, grew up, lived in a small village, you know, went to um, schools in my community. But when I look back, the, the activity that helped me the most, I believe, to succeed and to get to where I am is actually not what happened in my classroom, but what happened during competitions. So public speaking, yeah. debate, poetry recitation, those were my three yeah. favorite activities. But when I reflect that ability and that opportunity to get on stage, impromptu, talk about topics, uh, you know, challenge people about their opinions, those skills and those experiences shaped me and then led me down the path of you know, community service and social work. So I think one of the biggest influences, no matter where in the world you know, we are today, is taking a real good look at the curriculum from kindergarten to all the way up to university and ensuring that the classroom really becomes an incubator you know, for students to experience new things, to be curious about things, to challenge, you know, ideas, whether it's from the teacher or one of their peers. I think that's really critical. And the other thing is for academic institutions, from schools to universities, to partner in a deep and meaningful way with industry. Because industries provide a lot of the jobs, right? And industries are the ones that actually take care of a lot of innovation sure. in society. Yeah. So if we can start partnering with them at a very early stage, have students go in and do internships, co-ops, SFU is a classic example. We have a huge you know, department that supports you know, almost 10,000 plus students every year yeah. to do co-ops and internships. Right. And so I think it's really trying to understand what are the ingredients you need you know, to make sure you have a success formula that society, you know, uh, is able to not only appreciate entrepreneurial talent, but also encourage and make it possible for people to become what I call serial entrepreneurs. Yeah, very, right? very kind. Mean, that's a that's a beautiful term. I always like that serial entrepreneur. And you underline the fact. I mean, that's really important. That the aging population here in the Western economies and India are going to be one of the youngest country by 2025. Right. The biggest challenge would be like, how do we bridge up? Right. Because at the moment, in the last few years, when we check the figures, like the trade uh, between India and Canada, the bilateral trade numbers, the number of MOUs uh, signed in the last few years, they have been very slow. I mean, the full, I mean, the optimum potential was never realized. And when we talk to these uh, chamber and commerce, uh, these institutions also, like they agree to the fact that we were never able to achieve what should have been done. Right. You call it failure of diplomatic or political talk, uh, political level negotiations or whatever. But maybe do you see any hope that this will further? I mean, it's a sort of compulsion and binding on both economies that if you want to enhance your businesses, you want to bridge up these very gaps. I mean, you have to have a vision to improve that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I have the pleasure of you know working closely with the Indian consulate. Um, and when I was in India for the Women Economic uh, Forum, um, yeah. um, I was able to go to Canada House yeah. and meet with the officials there and uh, talk to a lot of you know people who are involved in business, yeah. uh, both in India and here and in Canada, yeah. and students. And they're very and positive. I mean, people to people, positive. they actually want to make huge investments. Yes. The one issue that has come up, yeah. no matter who you talk to, yeah. is the issue of mobility. True. So when people freely move, you know, between there's no restrictions yeah. for people to go from Canada to visit India or vice versa. Right. You know, people can freely go. In fact, now there's a direct flight to Delhi. Yeah. So, you know, it's easy. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't actually travel. 
and explore these countries, right? So if you look at the student population in Canada, and the federal government raised it as a concern, um, you know, uh, last year, very few students from Canada actually travel, go live, experience, maybe work, you know, in another part of the world when they're young. Sorry. If you look at the number of international students coming to different parts of the world, including Canada, it's really quite disproportionate. So I personally feel that, you know, encouraging young people and giving them resources to travel to India, experience India, yeah. work, volunteer in India, yeah. will go a long way. And the same with the businesses. But another thing that uh, struck me when I was, uh, you know, in Canada in the early days was how people had a huge familiarity with Northern India. Yeah. but very little about Other different sides. parts of yeah, India, true. whether it's east, west, or south. And they are beautiful states. Right? Not yeah. they're beautiful states, yeah. but also they are technologically, well, they course. are yeah. very advanced. So for example, I'm a huge um, uh, fan of uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency. Oh. So, you know, I for fun, family and friends call me the crypto mom. I used to be <laughs> the soccer mom, now I'm the crypto mom, right? I have two young sons who are very involved in blockchain and crypto uh, space. So I've started to educate myself about and develop some skills in that area. And I was really amazed that Telangana and Kerala were the two states that recently had a blockchain summit. And people from all over the world were there. So I think one of the ways in which, whether it's Chamber of Commerce, boards of trade, governments, businesses, I think one of the things we can do is actually make sure there's mobility corridors between Canada and all parts of India, and we link Canadian business people, young entrepreneurs, and others to people around the country. Because there are some people who are interested in social enterprise yeah. and in NGO kind of work. There are others who are more interested you know, in profit-making organizations and the more hardcore business models. Mm -hmm. We have all of that, you know, in, in India, which has a population of more than 1.3 billion. So there's no shortage of uh, diversity there. So I think academic institutions can play a big role. Uh, businesses can play a big role. Governments definitely can play a big role. And the tourism industry can definitely, you know, play a big role. Uh, talking about um, partnerships, for example, the Vancouver International uh, South Asian Film Festival, VISAP. Yeah. It happens every year here in uh, Vancouver. And it brings the entertainment talent and movies from India to Vancouver. Yeah, yeah. And people all over Canada come over to experience it. And in that small uh, program, which runs over a week, the exchange of cross-cultural ideas, yeah. you know, entertainment, yeah. uh, technologies, uh, and the different partnerships that get built is quite amazing. Yeah. The other one that SFU is very involved in, we are one of the founding members, is the India Summer Festival okay. that happens every uh, yeah. summer yeah. Uh, here in uh, Vancouver. Same thing. Every year they curate uh, content from India. They bring artists from all over India, uh, poets to performers, and then we have a big summer celebration here. And I think supporting, funding, and uh, publicizing these kind of events yeah. brings both countries closer, yeah. which eventually I think will have a positive impact you know, on the trade. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think for business people, the ease of doing business and the regulatory framework, I think are critical. So on both sides, yeah. if that can be reduced, yeah. simplified, you know, you have a one-stop shop True. on both sides, right. which we already do in some True. cases, it'll go a long way. Right. And you talked about summer festival. I mean, from Channel I would love to collaborate with us. If you on any kind of festivals, I mean, that Absolutely. promotes multiculturalism or bilateral relations. That's fantastic. And, I'll be in touch with you on that. Oh, why not? Why not? <laughs> and on, you talked about blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Yeah. I see a lot many young entrepreneurs getting into that. Yes. I mean, even some of the Western banks, they are now going for blockchain because they find it more secure than other technologies. I mean, especially in times when there is a loss of data, big data, and all that. Right. And even in India, like National Skill Development Corporation, they're actually nurturing the talents of youth and the mandate is only to, uh, to lay emphasis on skill development. So how do you, uh, how do you see SFU collaborating with India? And yes. w what's your mandate on that? Yes, I mean, you raised some very valuable points. I mean, it's interesting in your first question was about, um, you know, the, the, the speed of change yeah. and, and all the disruptions happening and the impact on society. 
blockchain and cryptocurrency and the whole digital transformation yeah. of society um, has received good press and bad press. Yeah. Because as with any technology or any big change, few things will go wrong or there'll be some gaps you know, in, in that field. And blockchain is no exception to that. Yeah. But it's an exciting disruptive technology with immense potential, right? Um, I got interested in it, frankly, because my two sons, who are 20 and 22, okay. uh, became blockchain crypto investors oh. in their late teens. Wonderful. And they got involved with uh, 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 an organization that invited them to a global uh, investor summit in Vietnam. Wonderful. So these two teenagers got on a plane, took off to Vietnam, came back absolutely fascinated uh -huh. by this, and they started to educate me, their mm -hmm. mom, yeah. <laughs> you know, about this. I, as a social worker, kind of stayed away from it for a while, yeah. but I got very interested in it when I found out how supply chain, for instance, for vaccines yeah. can be supported by blockchain, by making sure that you don't compromise the quality oh. of a vaccine from the point where it leaves the first station to the point where it reaches the child who needs that life-saving vaccination. Wonderful. Through supply chain, uh, through the blockchain influence supply chain, you can keep track of the movement of the vaccines, the quality, the temperature, and make sure nobody who should not be touching it is touching it. Same thing with smart contracts. There are now real estate platforms using cryptocurrency yeah. and blockchain technology, where through smart contracts, you don't have middle people, right? And everything's encrypted, yeah. right? And it cannot yeah. be modified or yeah. uh, altered. So, yeah, and it makes it more safe. It makes it more safe, yeah. right? So like with all technology, it's in its infancy and it's going to grow and evolve and perfect itself over time. But the potential is tremendous. And then what is most exciting is finding out the philanthropic aspect of it. Okay. So you have a lot of young entrepreneurs yeah. who actually donate crypto money for good causes, okay. whether it's to save refugees from difficult situations. Mm -hmm. United Nations, UNICEF are all now accepting cryptocurrency as donations. There are universities that accept cryptocurrency as fees. Wonderful. So it's, it's affecting lots of things. In Australia, um, there is a city uh, that has cryptocurrency ATM machines. You can buy your coffee with with crypto. Wow. In a way, are you indicating that alternate currencies can be the future? I think alternate currencies are already the future because the fact that they exist and you can actually uh, have transactions with it on Craigslist. It asks you whether you'll accept cryptocurrency. I mean, with Bitcoin, nice. you can do a lot of things, right? You can you can buy. That's a topic <laughs> we need to dwell on further. Yeah. I mean, so far. Yeah. We'll have so a going back to the partnership between yeah. India and uh, and uh, SFU, uh, SFU has a uh, India strategy which is more than ten years old, and we're very proud to have been one of the first universities that partnered with India in a big way. We have fantastic relationships with Tata Institute of Social Sciences, TIS in Mumbai. Uh, our president and our incoming president um, just recently visited uh, Tata Institute and a few other institutions in India. And we also have partnerships with the businesses in India. And we encourage our students to go there and our faculty to go there. And we also make sure that we have talent from India uh, visiting us over here. So that partnership is growing and very excited to see what's happening with it. We have an India Advisory Council here uh, in the local mainland where we have uh, Indian uh, leaders from different sectors Wonderful. who are part of the Advisory Council and uh, President Andrew Petter and my Vice President Joanne Curry, myself and a few others sit on it with um, leading South Asian um, individuals in the community uh, who work with us on a number of things. Wonderful. And uh, you also participated at the Women Economic Forum in New mm -hmm. Delhi. And uh, how do you see the culture of uh, women entrepreneurs? I mean, if, if you could compare with Canada vis a vis India, how, how do you see that happening, shaping up? Thank you for asking the question. I have to say, attending the Women Economic Forum in 2019 uh, in Delhi at the invitation of uh, Dr. Harbin Arora was life changing for me. Um, I left India in my early 20s and I immigrated to Canada in 1995. Yeah. So I've been far away uh, from India. I've visited a few times 
and I also went to work in India for two years um, as head of HR uh, between 2015 and 2017. But for most part, I've been away. Okay. What shocked me was the number of women yeah. entrepreneurs, yeah. the hubs, the incubators, the support systems for them from government, banks, business leaders, uh, you know, uh, women champions, you name it. It was incredible. Um, and what really was amazing was the number of high school children, youth, who attended the, uh, the Women Economic Forum and spoke about what yeah. they were doing, mainly in the social enterprise space, but they had decided they were going to become entrepreneurs. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that uh, connects me to India in a very meaningful and deep way is I'm one of the special advisors to a socially conscious business based out of Chennai um, called Hash Hack Code uh, and Tech Diva. And these two groups were started by a young uh, entrepreneur, uh, Mr. Manu Shaker, who went back from Toronto and decided to do work to empower women and girls in, in the state of Chennai. And basically what we do is teach coding to individuals, especially girls and women from very marginalized populations and also for differently abled uh, young people, especially people with autism. We teach them coding and make tech education accessible to them at low or no cost. So there are tons of examples, both you know, on the Indian side yeah. and here you know, in, in Canada. Uh, on 22nd of February, uh, I'm going to be one of the keynote speakers and uh, I'm hoping you can also attend, uh, Vinay. Sure. Uh, the Your EduConnect okay. conference is happening here in Vancouver right. at uh, the SFU campus. And the topic is the future of work wow. and how young people can embrace yeah. entrepreneurship. Uh, Your EduConnect was founded by a young international student, um, Inayat Ur Rahman, um, who has been working with me closely and basically has this conference to bring young people, mainly university students, government officials, media, Wonderful. and businesses so yeah. that they can network and understand what kind of skilling and knowledge they need to thrive in the new disrupted world. Wonderful. So hope to see you there on the 22nd. Yeah, sure, sure. And thank you so much, Shubhmani, for throwing so many, yes, I'm in such wonderful light on so many aspects. And we'll continue to hear more from your side, Absolutely. you being an expert. And we really look forward for more conversations. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Such a pleasure, Vinay. Thank, thank you. You are watching Channel Y. Channel Y. A South Asian Canadian channel.